Okay, hello everyone, how's it going? This is the third lecture. Um, the first lecture we talked about DNA replication. Second lecture we talked about um, transcription of DNA. And I was talking about transcription as being the first step in gene expression, where we have transcription and translation sort of um, working together to make new proteins. Um, you may be forgiven to expect that maybe today I will talk about translation, but that's not the case. We haven't finished talking about transcription and processing of RNA at this stage. So today's lecture is just going to finish off um, looking at transcription in eukaryotes and then looking at the messenger RNA that's made, how it needs to be processed before it can go into translation to be made, translated into a protein. So we're going to look at... Um, um, we're going to look at transcription in eukaryotes and then we're going to look at RNA processing before next week when we look at translation. Okay? So, <clears throat> okay, so, um, so today we're doing um, transcription in eukaryotes first. So, so in... E. coli, we, we looked at the RNA polymerase. It was just RNA polymerase without any sort of further um, nomenclature. When we look at um, transcription in eukaryotes, there are three types of RNA polymerase that, we'll be, that we need to know about. And I've, I've kind of mentioned these last week anyway. Um, and we have RNA polymerase 1, 2, and 3. Um, now, th these are fairly similar to what we know about RNA polymerase in eukaryotes. So again, we can take that information and carry it across into eukaryotes. But um, there's probably a trend that you've identified is that when we look at things in eukaryotes, there's typically a few extra proteins involved and a little bit of change that has occurred in the process over time, even though it's fundamentally the same um, um, process. So um, when we look at... So, so we, we'll look at these... Um, um, polymerases in a little bit of, you know, just over a couple of slides. And then th the other big difference is when we move from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, we're moving from a genome which might have 5,000 genes or less than 5,000 genes to eukaryotes that we've got at least 35,000 genes, if not more. So we have, um, we have more um, control required to specify one gene over another because there's more genes to choose from. So it, again, if you think about it, it's probably quite logical to think that there are more transcription factors in eukaryotes that give specificity to the process of transcription. Okay? So transcription factors, I'm sure you've come across them before. They're um, proteins that bind to DNA, and whilst they bind to DNA, they help control DNA metabolism, and if you think of transcription as DNA metabolism, okay? So transcription factors um, are going to be binding to promoter regions of genes to turn particular genes on and off using the same transcription machinery. So there's only one transcription machinery for messenger RNA, and that's DNA polym the RNA polymerase 2. So that transcription machinery needs to be given specificity and that's, it's given specificity through interaction with, its, with transcription factors. Okay? So in eukaryotes, we have a bunch of transcription factors, and these will bind to promoter sequences of genes to give specificity to the RNA polymerases. Okay? Um, <clears throat> again, because um, we have more DNA, it, it, again, it's not, no surprise that more regions of DNA are involved in regulating genes than in prokaryotes. So sometimes in eukaryotes, we have distant regions of DNA that are involved with regulating the, 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 the gene. So the gene might be located here, and many tens of thousands of base pairs away, there's another bit of DNA, which is an enhancer, not a promoter, and the enhancer can somehow loop around and be involved in regulation at that promoter. So we have... Um, we have distance enhancers which can be, like I said, tens of thousands of base pairs away or just a couple of hundred base pairs away, okay? But they're not directly at the promoter region where the RNA polymerase 2 is going to be binding, okay? 
So distant enhancer regions are also involved. So more transcription factors and more bits of DNA. So the, uh, another big difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is eukaryotes have a nucleus. So the genome in eukaryotes is wrapped by this membrane and all the bits in there is referred to as, as, as the nucleus. Whereas in prokaryotes, the DNA doesn't have a distinct nucleus. So, um, so we have to um, move the messenger RNA out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm for translation to begin. So I'll finish off the lecture by looking at some of the basic transport mechanism to get RNA out of the nucleus or back into the nucleus, as the case may be. And the other issue is that in eukaryotes we have a lot more DNA, so the DNA is packaged. And we'll look at um, DNA packaging, I think, maybe in some later lectures. Um, but we're not going to cover DNA packaging in this lecture. Okay? And um, DNA is packaged into um, nucleosomes in eukaryotes. All right, so um, there are, I, I've mentioned this already, but I'll just refresh it. There are three kinds of RNA polymerase in eukaryotes. We have RNA polymerase 1, 2, and 3. Polymerase 1 binds to a single type of promoter, there's, and there's not many of these promoters, and these promoters code for ribosomal RNA. It's referred to as pre-RNA because those messenger, sorry, those ribosomal RNAs need to be um, cut and um, sort of modified before they're referred to as just rRNA. So these are pre-RNA. So, um, so there's a, a, a couple of genes with a very specific promoter that can bind and tether the um, RNA polymerase 1, and then th that's involved in making these pre-RNA molecules. Um, also, um, we have RNA polymerase 2, which is the polymerase that transcribes um, genes, so it's making RNA that we, we refer to as messenger RNA. And the RNA polymerase 2 is the polymerase we'll talk most about in this lecture. And we'll look at some of the specific features of the RNA polymerase 2 that enable it to process messenger RNAs. Because it's important that we process messenger RNAs before translation. And then we have a third polymerase, which is RNA polymerase 3. It recognizes... Um, a, a, another bunch of promoter sequences that code for transfer RNAs and a small 5S R RNA and um, some s um, small regulatory RNAs. So not messenger RNAs for RNA polymerase 3, but, but basically tRNAs and one of the important um, ribosomal RNAs. So we have three types of RNA polymerase and we can loosely say we've got three types of promoters as well, um, with the promoters for the messenger RNAs being the most diverse because there's well over 35,000 of these um, promoters. So you'd expect there to be some diversity within them, where there's only a handful of genes that code for our RNA, and there's only dozens or, of um, genes that code for transfer RNAs but there's tens of thousands of genes that code for messenger RNAs. So these promoters are going to be more diverse. Okay, so we are looking at these um, polymerases in eukaryotes, and then um, we look at the promoters to which they're binding. Um, we'll notice that there are conserved sequences in the promoter regions, um, refer to, I'm sure you've heard about these, Tata boxes. So Tata just meaning it's a TA rich sequence. So Tata. Okay. Um, and the, unsurprisingly, the protein, the transcription factor, if you like, that binds to Tata sequences is called a Tata box binding protein. All right. So it's not the polymerase directly that's binding to the Tata box, it's the Tata box binding protein which will interact with the polymerase. Um, the Tata box occurs, as I'll show in the next slide, at about 
a position minus 30, and the minus 30 is relative to the start of transcription, which is plus 1. And um, the Tata box plays a major role in transcription initiation. Um, and it's at this um, Tata box in the promoter where the other proteins required to make up what we call the transcription machinery will assemble. And part of that transcription machinery is the RNA polymerase II. Okay? Um, there's a, a diagram here showing um, a promoter of a ribosomal RNA. So this is a promoter which is recognized by RNA polymerase I. And um, again, we've got the plus one and the bendy elbow, which is referring to the start of transcription. So in the um, three prime direction of this gene, or if you like, downstream is the gene. So when we go um, from the promoter into the gene sequence, we're going in the downstream direction. So think of a stream. If you drop something in the stream, it's going to flow downstream. So the, the, the analogy is from the promoter, you go downstream um, into the gene. And when you go upstream, you, you know, you're, you're fighting the current, if you like, and upstream takes you into the promoter, into these minus um, numbered um, nucleotides, and in the promoter you're going to find some control elements, such as an upstream control element. So it's called upstream because it's in the upstream direction. Downstream takes you into the exon. And it's upstream and downstream are both relative to plus one, the start of transcription. Okay? Otherwise, you can talk about five prime directions and three prime directions. It's all the same to me, but textbooks also use the upstream, downstream um, directions as well. So um, here we have a, a conserved region in the promoter region of the um, ribosomal RNAs in the different promoters for the ribosomal RNAs. is this conserved region here. Hence, it's called a core region because it's conserved. And also, there's a conserved upstream control element. And how does it work? It's fairly simple. There's a couple of transcription factors that bind. Um, and these is, these is called, this upstream region is bound by an upstream binding factor. And um, these um, transcription factors bind to the promoter and facilitate um, sort of a bending, a structural change in the promoter and the binding of the RNA polymerase one. And then again, you can see within this polymerase, you've got the start of um, transcription with the RNA um, being um, made from scratch within the, the polymerase. So we have these um, binding sites in the promoter. They help to bind some of these transcription factors um, labeled here. And then this helps to recruit the RNA polymerase one to the promoter of the ribosomal RNA genes. And don't forget, ribosomal RNAs are not translated. Okay, they, they don't code for proteins. They're, they're, it's the RNA molecule itself, which is the functional molecule. It's the ribosomal RNAs that have catalytic activity and that are involved in um, the process of translation. And we'll talk about that next week. Okay, the other, we've got two more promoters to get through, um, RNA polymerase II promoters. So don't forget, polymerase II codes for messenger RNA. So these are the promoters, um, the diverse promoters um, that are upstream of, of um, the, uh, the, the, the coding sequences, the genes. So many of the POL2 promoters share common features, such as a Tata box, again at minus 30, and um, an initiator sequence. So this um, INR, this initiator sequence, um, which is near the, the start site. So this figure I'll show you in the next slide here. So there's the initiator sequence here. And um, sometimes also within these promoter regions, there's an upstream um, recognition site as well. Um, now, a little bit on the nomenclature of transcription factors. It's, it's, it's an easy system, but you've just got to know the system. If, if it's a, when you're looking at the basal transcription machinery, the basic transcription machinery required for gene expression, um, there's a whole bunch of factors. And if we're talking about RNA polymerase II, then those transcription factors, those TFs, are referred to as TF2 something. 
So TF2 means it's a tr transcription factor as part of the basal transcription fa factors required for RNA polymerase 2. Okay? TF1s would be transcription factor, you know, RNA polymerase 1, and TF3s for polymerase 3. So we have um, an upstream a factor here called TF2B recognition element. So some of the transcription factors at required for polymerase 2, there's a whole bunch of them. There's A, B, C, D, E, F, Gs, a whole bunch of them. So we have an upstream element here called TF2B, which is recognized and highly conserved amongst um, these genes. So here's the figure. So this is showing the start of transcription here, the tartar box here with its tartar box binding protein in place, and then we have the TF2B protein bound at the that, that B um, recognition element shown here, and then you've got this initiator sequence here and a downstream promoter sequence here. So that it's just showing you that at these messenger RNA promoters, there's a bunch of different sequences that are involved in bringing specificity and assembling the basal transcription machinery to that site. And, and again, here's the start of transcription shown here. So what's not shown um, in this diagram yet is the RNA polymerase 2 itself, which is going to come in and interact with this basal transcription machinery. Okay? Um, the TF2D protein is shown here. It's a, a, a much larger complex. And then at some point you're going to have the polymerase 2 coming in as well. So, so, so as I said earlier, um, at the RNA polymerase 2 promoter sequences, um, there are also some upstream promoter elements and enhancers. Enhancers tend to be even further away that are involved in, in regulation of these genes. And these sequences that are involved in reg regulation can be located many thousands of base pairs away from the promoter. So if you think about it, you've got two bits of DNA that are really, really separated in, in space. So somehow the enhancer needs to interact with the promoter. So that DNA somehow has to come around. So, um, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, there was lots of great arguments going on in the literature about whether the DNA was able to loop back and interact. And if it does look back, how does it happen? And, you know, all of that stuff. And there was other theories being thrown around as well. And you were a looper or you were not a looper in, 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 in those days. But um, textbooks tend to simplify things and say, Looping is a thing, and I, I think looping is a thing, and there's plenty of evidence that says looping is a thing, and that the DNA can loop back, even if it's many thousands of base pairs away, it can functionally come back and interact with the promoter. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and also, at these upstream um, enhancers and promoter elements, there are a bunch of specific transcription factors that bind to these sequences. And often it's the same transcription factors that bind at the enhancer that also bind at the promoter. So often they've got the binding sequences for the same transcription factors. Okay. And the, the last set of promoters we'll just quickly mention are the pr promoters for the transfer RNAs and the, and the 5S ribosomal RNA. And th these are the promoters um, transcribed by RNA polymerase two, uh, 3. And um, um, polymerase 3 seems to be um, the polymerase with the most subunits. Um, it transcribes these short, untranslated RNA molecules, and again, not being used to make proteins, but untranslated RNAs. And again, they, form, that they perform a function as an RNA molecule in the cell. OK, so. I think for the rest of the lecture, we're going to focus pretty much on genes, so messenger RNA um, transcription. And this is all done by the RNA polymerase 2, which is very similar to the RNA polymerase that we looked at in E. coli. OK, so we can sort of um, think more about what we know about um, transcription in E. coli. Um, but now we're looking at eukaryotes. So the polymerase 2 um, is responsible for um, transcription of all messenger RNAs, as well as a few micro RNAs. The RNA polymerase 2 is a multi subunit protein 
we looked at this hollow enzyme in E. coli and it had five subunits plus the sigma to make to, to carry out initiation. Well, in eukaryotes, we've, we've uh, upped the ante now. We've been supersized to an RNA polymerase II that has 12 subunits, okay? And rather than having a sigma factor, we have a whole bunch of different transcription factors that are specific to um, um, the polymerase and the promoter. So this is just doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the polymerase we talked about last week, which was bacterial RNA polymerase, and the RNA polymerase II in E. coli that's responsible for transcribing messenger RNAs. And you can see here, functionally, it's um, very similar, and structurally, it's very similar to what um, had evolved in E. coli, but there are some extra proteins involved. And those extra proteins carry out very important functions in E. coli, uh, in eukaryotes. So if you look at these proteins, the textbooks label them four and seven. I, I, but th these proteins here, we're going to refer to those two proteins as the carboxy terminal domain. Okay? So the CTD. And that will come up in the slides. You'll see carboxy terminal domain quite often. And that's the domain that we're talking about in the um, RNA polymerase two. And we'll talk about some of the important roles carried out by this. Um, it's like a handle. It's like a little thing that sticks out, and it's like a handle on the polymerase. So I might refer to it as the handle, even though it's the carboxy terminal domain, just so, because um, that's what it looks like in the diagrams I'll be showing you. Okay. So, um, so a, a lot of what we know about the RNA polymerase two is based on um, the structure function relationships that are also true of RNA polymerase. Um, in E. coli, except we've got this um, carboxy terminal domain that's new. So um, last week we did a, I showed you a, a sort of a cyclic diagram showing initiation, elongation, termination of transcription in E. coli. These sentences are really long and convoluted. I have to think them through as I'm saying them. Um, but we're going to look again at this kind of cycle in um, eukaryotes. So an overview of transcription is that um, we've got a whole bunch of transcription factors that will associate with the promoter, um, and then these factors will recruit the RNA polymerase II, and this will form a pre-initiation complex. Um, this is then converted into um, an um, initiation complex, um, and that, that involves the unwinding of DNA to form a bubble, as we talked about last week. Um, you have unwinding of a short region of, I think it was about 17 base pairs of DNA forming this bubble in, um, in the vicinity of the polymerase. Now, this is that handle, that panhandle I was talking about. So it's the C-terminal um, domain, or the CTD. This is that bit I'll show you in the next diagram um, that's unique in eukaryotes. And it can be phosphorylated during um, initiation. And its phosphorylation status is very important for its function. Um, we then have a process of elongation, where the, you know, where the polymerase just reads through the gene, and then we have a process of um, termination. And initiation and termination, um, this, this CTD, this handle, has an important role in both those processes. So this is the um, cycle of um, one round of transcription shown here. So again, we've got a polymerase with this carboxy terminal domain shown here. We've got the various um, initiator or, you know, Tata box or various um, conserved sequences or important sequences in the promoter region surrounding the start of transcription. And the initiator proteins bind, the polymerase is tethered into this complex to form a pre-initiation complex. You then get the forming this bubble, and this is, um, and then you get the breaking away of some of these factors here. And if you notice, if you look at this carboxy terminal domain, in the initiation complex, it's not phosphorylated, okay? During the initiation of transcription, this region of this carboxy terminal domain becomes phosphorylated. 
and that allows it to break away and clear the, um, the, this basal transcription machinery and then read into the gene. And then it continues to um, make the, um, the, the, the RNA and the RNA is made and as the RNA exits this RNA exit channel which we had in E. coli, as it exits the channel, notice how it's in close proximity to this carboxy terminal domain. Again, so again, as the messenger RNA is feeding through this channel here, it comes into proximity to this carboxy terminal domain. And this sort of protruding domain here can bind lots of different proteins and bring those proteins into close proximity to the messenger RNA because the messenger RNA needs to be acted on by various proteins during its synthesis. So it's this part of the, um, the polymerase which brings in or tethers in these different proteins to work on the uh, messenger RNA. And at some point, um, a termination sequence is, is reached. Um, the RNA terminates transcription. The carboxy terminal domain is dephosphorylated and then again we can enter another round of transcription. So um, this is the um, cycle of transcription and the important function of this carboxy terminal domain we'll look at um, in the next, you know, during this lecture. Um, now don't forget we're looking at eukaryotes here so um, I'm sure you know, if not I'm going to be telling you that this messenger RNA needs to be processed on its 5' prime and its 3' prime end. And also, this um, messenger RNA contains exons and introns. And the introns need to be removed from the messenger RNA before it's translated. So a lot of that happens um, through interactions with proteins on this carboxy terminal domain. And we'll talk about that during this lecture. Um, I've tried to simplify this and, and not focus too much on it because there's a lot of factors involved in the um, initiation of transcription. And because we're talking at, because we're talking about RNA polymerase two, all of the transcription factors, these TFs, are referred to as TF two something. So we've got TF two B, F E H, and there's a whole bunch of them. So, um, so these factors are involved in um, building this pre-initiation complex here as, we've, as I showed you in that circle um, loop diagram, the previous slide. And, um, and this is just showing that the order of assembly of these factors has been well studied and it's well documented. We, we don't have to need to know it for this level of lecture, but the actual assembly order of these factors coming into play at the promoter is a well-defined process and it's, it's, um, um, it's well-ordered. And then as the um, complex, um, as you get phosphorylation of the carboxy terminal domain, you get dissociation of some of these um, transcription factors as well, which can then be recycled to initiate another round of transcription. Um, so it, it, a really simple way of looking at the at the transcription is so one of the first events is the binding of the um, the tartar box binding protein at the tartar box, and this um, helps to open up the um, tartar box um, to form this um, bubble. The starting of this bubble forms at a region of AT bases because AT bases are easy to separate. Um, there's a helicase activity associated. Um, or included. So some of these other proteins have defined functions such as a helicase activity. So TF2H is, is a helicase and this promotes unwinding of the um, DNA to open, to start the formation of this bubble. And, um, and, and like we had in prokaryotes, we get some abortive transcripts. So the, 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 the problem for the cell of assembling those first few nucleotides in a stable way is difficult. So again, um, sometimes it fails and it has to restart, fails, it restarts, and at some point the, the, right, the, the, the messenger RNA becomes stable and long enough and, and well bound to the template so that um, elongation can proceed. 
So again, it's the same kind of processes that we looked at in E. coli, except we've got um, different proteins involved, but functionally a very similar process. Um, the thing that's distinct, or clearly distinct from here, is that the carboxy terminal domain of the RNA polymerase II um, needs to be phosphorylated before the polymerase can leave the promoter. So this region here um, needs to become phosphorylated, as shown here. Okay, so in um, eukaryotes, we also, we also have another big protein assembly thing that's involved in transcription and involved in regulating transcription, and this is called the mediator complex. So if you think of a mediator, a mediator, like if you're going through some sort of difficult situation, a mediator is someone who brings parties together and initiates some sort of discussion or transfer of information. I don't know how you want to think about it. So, so these mediator proteins play an important role in um, looping, bringing the DNA into close proximity to the promoter and bringing in various proteins into close proximity. So the mediator complex is again one of these really big protein assemblies um, that helps um, during the initiation of uh, messenger RNA synthesis. So um, it's, it's a large set of evolutionary conserved proteins. That's textbook jargon to tell you that it was studied in yeast. Whenever you see something that's been evolutionarily conserved, it means, well, actually it was studied in the, another model organism, and it, and it also is true for um, mammalians. So, so I know that because I, I, I was a yeast geneticist for many years, and we used to study the mediator complex. Oh, I used to read about the mediator complex when I was doing that, so hence my um, little in-joke there. Um, so we'll have a look at this mediator complex, and it's involved in binding to um, some of these... TF2 proteins, and um, here's what it looks like. Um, shown in blue here is a big assembly of these proteins. Um, I think 20 years ago, when you looked at a promoter, you'd say it's pea soup. It's just a whole bunch of different things all assembled and floating around, and it just looks unwieldy, and we don't understand it. But now, people have studied the mediator, mediator complex in exquisite detail, using lots of techniques, and it's, it's a real thing, and it, it's, it's a real, you know, that the proteins are assembled in a very, you know, well-defined way, and people are still trying to grapple with some of the functions and some of the, the roles this thing does. But, so this is, this is um, a mediator complex here. Um, so the mediator functions as an intermediary between um, things bound at the um, promoter region and things bound at the enhancer or other upstream sites. So you've got the promoter region here, and then you've got a, a long read of, of DNA going um, upstream from the promoter. And it, it's, it's the interactions between these proteins and the mediator, and then the mediator and the t transcription factors that help control transcription. Okay, so it's, it's quite a complex process. Um, so, but if you just think about it as a whole bunch of proteins that facilitate interactions between the enhancers and the promoters, that's probably enough. Um, there's a mistake in the textbook diagram here. Notice how these green blobs are referred to as transcription activators, which is correct. But on this section here, it's referred to those proteins as sequences, what it actually means these DNA sequences. So these labels should be pointing to the DNA. I mean, it's trivial, don't worry about it, but um, I just noticed that when I was looking at the slide. Um, so again, we'll talk about this more in a couple of lectures' time, but there are transcription factors here which are bound directly to the DNA. So you've got um, protein DNA interactions here, and you've got protein DNA interactions here. But what the mediator is doing is facilitating protein protein interactions. So the mediator in this diagram here is not actually binding to the DNA, it's binding to other proteins that are bound to the DNA. So these are bound to the DNA, and these are the transcription factors or transcription activators. 
and these are bound to the DNA and these are the part of the basal transcription machinery, the mediator is facilitating these protein-protein interactions to bring that other DNA into, into proximity. Right, moving along. Um, so, like I said, the mediated complex supports transcriptional activation and increases the rate and efficiency of the pre-initiation complex by bringing these regions together. Um, <clears throat> so, once we've got initiation of transcription and elongation, we hit the end of the gene and there's a mechanism for termination and these mechanisms um, differ depending on which polymerase we're actually looking at. Um, if you're looking at RNA polymerase 3, it terminates once it reaches a T-rich sequence, which is um, just um, three prime, uh, up from the three prime end of the messenger RNA. And it's just a few proteins involved in re recognizing this T-rich sequence. For RNA polymerase 1, Again, there's a term termination site, um, but this termination site um, again is just located downstream and requires um, a bunch of specific factors, um, but it's a different um, terminator site to the T-rich sequence that was observed for the RNA um, of, or, or the DNA of the um, genes transcribed by Pol3. So these two genes have different terminator sequences that, are, that, are, that interact with some proteins and that terminate transcription. <coughs> so <coughs> as I was saying, we've got over 35,000 genes in, in our genome, so it's probably of no surprise that the termination sequences are more diverse for messenger RNAs. And these termination sequences can occur um, a few base pairs or a few thousand base pairs away from the end of the messenger RNA. And part, a, a common theme for these um, termination sequences is that they include sequences that will lead to the formation of a poly A tail on the messenger RNA. And, um, and um, termination of transcription is coupled to the um, polyadenylation of the messenger RNA. So, um, so we've got termination sequences that can be just downstream or many thousands of base pairs downstream from the end of the messenger RNA sequence. Um, the termination involves polyadenylation of the messenger RNA. So these poly A's, these many A residues need to be added after the fact that we're going to add just a string of A's onto the messenger RNA. And termination of transcription and the three prime processing, which involves leading the poly A tail, um, occurs um, um, uh, during termination. OK, so um, I'll, we'll continue now the same theme, but we'll just jump to chapter. So we'll just ju jump now to. Um, to chapter 15, where we're going to look at um, the processing of this messenger RNA um, as it's being transcribed. So, RNA molecules are synthesized in a form that needs to be processed before it becomes a functionally active molecule, and we'll look at how our messenger RNAs are processed. Um, the, the kinds of reactions involved in processing messenger RNAs um, is just a small subset of reactions. Um, typically, it involves cleavage, cutting the RNA molecule. It needs to be cleaved and then rejoined at a different point. And if you think about um, exons and introns, you've got to cut out the introns and join together the exons. So that's what it's talking about here. Typically, you've got to cleave the, um, the messenger RNA and then rejoin it to another bit of the message and remove the intervening sequences. And often, particularly for transfer RNAs, um, many of the, the, the nucleotides can be modified after the RNA has been made. So between making the RNA or the transfer RNA 
and its function, some of the, need to, some of the bases need to be chemically modified. And um, we'll look at that process when we, when we talk about transfer RNAs. Um, so, so, so we need to cleave and join um, these RNA molecules to make them active. Typically in um, metabolism and biochemistry, we, we talk about proteins carrying out catalytic activities. When we talk about RNA processing, um, some of the processing re reactions, so some of the cutting and joining of these messenger RNAs or these other RNA molecules are actually catalyzed by RNA molecules. Okay, so we have, it's not a case of proteins performing the catalysis or the, 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 the cutting of these messenger RNA molecules, but we have other RNA molecules performing um, biochemical reactions on these RNA molecules. And um, it's, a, it's a fascinating sort of um, area of molecular biology, and the ability of RNA molecules to um, catalyze and cleave themselves effectively um, without the need of DNA and proteins being involved in the process um, has um, lended a lot of weight to this, this theory that in early evolution life began with RNA molecules before um, DNA and protein molecules were um, b before they played such an important role as they do nowadays. So there's some really interesting reading in the science literature about the RNA world if you're interested. And there's, there's um, an academic at the, I'm not sure if he's at the Garvin or the Victor Chang. I think he's at the Garvin. So John Maddox, um, he does a lot of study with messenger RNA, with RNAs, and he talks a lot about the RNA world. So you often see him at conferences when you travel out of the uni into your science fields and domains. And he gives really great talks about um, all, all of the, he, he does a big summary of all of the background information that's forming this, this view. So it's actually quite interesting. All right. Um, so we're going to do a comparison of RNA processing now in bacteria and then switch to eukaryotes because it's a simpler system in bacteria and it helps us to understand what's happening in eukaryotes. So most bacterial messenger RNAs um, are, not, are not processed and sometimes the messenger RNAs in E. coli or in prokaryotes can actually be translated whilst they're being transcribed. So we, we say that transcription and translation are coupled in, in, in um, bacteria. So this is sort of a, a, an overview of what we're going to be talking about next week, which is translation, shown here, and um, transcription. So Here's our RNA polymerase shown in an E. coli without its carboxy terminal domain, so it's clearly then RNA polymerase from E. coli. It's transcribing a, uh, an RNA molecule here, and as it's leaving the exit channel and as it's sort of being actively synthesized on its three prime end, it's being translated from its five prime end. So the, um, the ribosomes are attaching to this um, message and starting to make these orange blobs here, which is a lot of amino acids strung together to make a protein. So in E. coli, it's a simpler system because there is no nucleus, so there is no mem membrane separating transcription from translation. Where in eukaryotes, we have transcription occurring in the nucleus and translation occurring in the cytosol. Okay, so this is a, um, an, an so functionally, this process occurs in eukaryotes, but it's separated by a, um, a membrane. So um, it's separated in space and time, if you want to use the Doctor Who analogy. Okay? Transcription occurs first, and then, well, it, it is. It, it's not just, like, uh, when I was waving my mouse here, I thought maybe you were thinking it, it passes through the membrane and then gets translated in eukaryotes. So it's actually space and time. It's what the textbook says. And I like Doctor Who. I don't watch it, but I used to like it when I was a kid. So, so, it's, so transcription occurs in the nucleus, and then the messenger RNA is, is processed. And then once it's finished being processed, it's physically moved out of the nucleus into the cytosol. 
and then once it's in the cytosol, it's then translated. And I've got that in a diagram coming up, following this slide. So when we look at this simple process here in eukaryotes, um, the messenger RNAs need to be um, chemically modified, so those cleavage and ligation reactions, and also the 5' prime and 3' prime ends need to be modified. So um, RNAs also need to be transported into the cytoplasm for translation. And if you think about the messenger RNA, it's got two ends. It's got a 5' prime end and a 3' prime end. We say that the 5' prime end is capped, so we have a 5' prime cap. And we say that the 3' prime end is, is where it's the A residues are added, so it becomes polyadenylated. So we, we, say, we say that it's got a tail, so it's capped and tailed. So capped on the 5' prime, tailed on the 3' prime ends. So this is just showing the process of transcription and translation or gene expression in eukaryotes. So within the, the nucleus here, we've got the process of transcription and the messenger RNA contains introns and then um, it needs to be processed. So after the RNA processing has taken place, we've got the removal of the introns and we've got a 5' prime cap, 3' prime tail. This then has to exit the nucleus into the cytosol where it can then be translated by these ribosomes. Okay? And then following translation and, and protein production, you get degradation of the messenger RNA. So the rest of this lecture, we're going to be talking about um, the, um, the, just, just the processing of the messenger RNA that occurs in the, in the nucleus. And then we'll, we'll mention a little bit about the um, degradation of the messenger RNA. So in eukaryotes, the messenger RNAs are said to not be um, contiguous meaning that um, the actual coding sequence that codes for the protein is separated by intervening regions of DNA that do not code for a protein and that need to be removed. So the coding sequences are called exons, the non-coding sequences are called introns, and the process of removing introns and joining together the exons, that's called splicing. So. Um, the, the term splicing is like an, an analogy to um, film editing, where you splice and, and cut the film and then rejoin the film. So in the old days, before digital technology, you bought this device, I've got one at home, for editing Super 8, or I haven't got 16 mm, I've got Super 8 film, and you sort of have to put the film in there and get a razor blade and cut the film, remove that bit and put some sticky tape on your film and then join it back together, and then hopefully when you run it through your projector, it doesn't snap at the point where you've joined it. So that process of um, editing film is pretty much what's happening when you're editing DNA. You're cutting out these intervening regions and joining them together to make the, 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 the bit that will be red. So, um, so the process of splicing um, introns, um, oh, so in the process of splicing, the introns are removed from the primary transcript and then the remaining bits are joined together. And this forms a continuous sequence then without any intervening sequences, and it's the spliced messenger RNA that actually codes for the protein. Okay? That's got this, the sequence, which you can look at the sequence of that messenger RNA, and you can, on a computer or a bit of pe pen and paper, you can convert that into a protein sequence directly, because all of the other sequences that are not required have been removed apart from the 5' prime and 3' prime ends, which, um, yeah. Okay, so, um, so this is just looking at some of the processing of messenger RNA. So this is our DNA sequence here. We've got our promoter, and there's our bendy elbow, a bendy arrow, again, indicating start of transcription. So this sequence is made into this sequence here. Now, the light blue and dark blue regions here, um, I think the, the, the pale blue refers to introns, and then the darker region refers to exons. And in the transcript here, you've got the exons in green, and the introns 
from the light blue now shown in orange. So these are the introns. And these introns are spliced out, removed, so that the exons now join. So this um, three prime boundary of this exon joins the five prime boundary of that exon. Okay, and then, so that is spliced to that, and that is spliced to that, to give a continuous sequence here. And then, um, during transcription, the poly A tail is added. Now, the poly A tail um, is added away from the template DNA. So there isn't a poly T sequence which is copied into a poly A sequence. The poly A sequence is added by a different enzyme which operates without a template and it can only take in the A nucleotide and just, just polymerize those. So the poly A tail is added in the absence of a template and then we've got this five prime cap which I'll dis discuss with you. And that gives us this finished messenger RNA which is a, um, um, referred to as a spliced messenger RNA and it's just got the exons joined together with a five prime cap and a three prime tail. Okay, I'll stop there for a short 10 minutes and then um, continue with the second half of the lecture. Anyway, let's move on. So, um, I've been describing to you some of the um, post-transcriptional um, modifications to messenger RNAs and um, so the first ones we'll talk about are capping and a polyadenylation. So part of needing to cap and polyadenylate um, messenger RNA is partly to protect the messenger RNA from degradation. I'm sure there's more to it. There's also re regulatory roles of these, um, these, the, the, these messenger RNAs, but um, partly it's, it's to protect them from degradation as well. So when... Um, and it also provides a means to, um, to well, to, to guard, guard the ends from degradation and, yeah, the, 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 they're also involved in regulating translation, but we're not going to talk about that, so I don't want to sort of put too many ideas in your heads because it just gets too confusing. Um, so, um, so, let's have a look at what these processes are. So, so the first process is, is capping at the five prime end. So if you think about, we're making the RNA transcript by adding um, nucleotides on the three prime end. So the bit that exits, exits is the five prime end that exits first. So the first bit of the messenger RNA that leaves the, the, um, the RNA polymerase through the exit channel is the five prime end. So that's the fit, bit that's modified first, if you like. So um, the single-stranded ribonucleotide, um, like I said, they can be degraded. And by adding a five prime cap to the um, messenger RNA, it protects it. What is the cap? The cap is another nucleotide that's added, but it's added through an unusual bond to the five prime end. Okay? So it's a, it's a guanosine nucleotide that's added to the five prime end. Um, the the guanosine is methylated on the 7 position, so it's referred to as 7-methylguanosine, but basically it's a guanosine with a slight modification. And it's linked to the 5' prime terminus, which is the first bit of the messenger RNA that exits the, um, the, the, the polymerase, and it's joined through an unusual 5' prime to 5' prime triphosphate linkage. So it's not a 5' prime to 3' prime phosphate, it's a 5 to 5' triphosphate linkage, all right? So the, the five prime cap is, is formed through a condensation reaction of a GTP to the five prime end of the transcript. The guanosine is methylated on N7, like I said, and it plays a critical role in, in bringing the ribosome onto the messenger RNA. So not only does the five prime cap protect the five prime end from exonucleases, it also plays a role in binding the, five, the, the, the end to a ribosome for translation, which will occur later. So, um, so here's a diagram from the textbook, um, which I've kind of broken into a few bits. So here's the incoming nucleotide that's going to act as the cap, and um, here's the N7, which will be methylated. So this is a bog standard um, nucleotide, so you, you should 
understand what that is. Um, here's the, um, the messenger RNA that's been made. Um, so here's the, um, yeah, so, so the first nucleotide that was included in the string of um, the message is here. And then the, the next one was added on the three prime end, but then the next one was added on the three prime end to make the string. So this is the three prime end of the molecule, which goes down the page. This is the five prime end, and it's still got its triphosphate attached, okay? Because this is the initial nucleotide that started the process. So there's going to be a condensation now between a pre-guanosine and the five prime end of the messenger RNA. So the first thing that happens is that um, there's a condensation, so um, a triphosphate is the product leaving this in place. So rather than having a, a 5-phosphate-3 three or 3-phosphate-5 three bond here, on the 5' prime end you've got a triphosphate bond, and it's between the 5' prime end and the 5' prime end. So the 5' prime carbon of the nucleotide and the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA, and it's a triphosphate bond. Okay, so that's the first thing that happens, and also this N here needs to be methylated, which then occurs once the condensation reaction has formed, and that gives you the um, the, the 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 five prime cap, and that protects the messenger RNA from degradation, and it also is recognised by the ribosome during translation. Now. Um, like I was saying to you earlier, the 5' prime end of the messenger RNA exits the polymerase first, because that's the bit that was made first. So as it exits, it comes into close proximity to the carboxy terminal domain, this handle that is unique to eukaryotes. And like I was saying, this um, carboxy terminal domain is able to tether different proteins into this, this, this area. So it's able to tether or bind to a guanyl transferase, which carries out that 5 prime to 5 prime triphosphate um, attachment of um, a G residue. So that occurs during transcription. So the, the, this end of the molecule is still being actively um, e extended, polymerized, but as the messenger RNA exits through the channel, it comes into proximity to this guanyl transferase and it's capped. Okay? And um, it's capped during transcription because of the proximity of this guanyl transferase associating with the carboxy terminal domain of the, um, of the polymerase 2. And if you remember, um, when I showed you, or we talked about the different polymerases, polymerase 1 and polymerase 3 don't have this carboxy terminal domain. So um, messenger, or sorry, RNAs from the other polymerases are not capped because they don't have this carboxy terminal domain and therefore they can't bring in this guanyl transferase. So that's very, again, it's structure function. This bit here um, it functionally allows capping to proceed. Eukaryotic messenger RNAs also have a distinct three prime end. Um, again, this three prime modification is thought to um, make the messenger RNAs survive longer in the cytosol to, to survive the attack from these um, um, nucleases that exist. And the messenger RNA will be polyadenylated. Um, now, there's a, the messenger RNA co contains a polyadenylation signal which will then trigger the process of polyadenylation. And to polyadenylate the messenger RNA, first you've got to cleave it, and then at the site where you cleave it, you then add a string of, of A residues. So you cut the messenger RNA, and then you add a bunch of A's onto it. And this is referred to as, as polyadenylation. And again, it occurs at the um, carboxy terminal domain of the RNA polymerase 2. And I've got a diagram that will show that. But first, this is just, um, like I said, this is the poly-A sequence, which is recognized by the cell. And then at this sequence, um, an endonuclease, don't forget endonuclease can cut in the middle of a nucleic acid um, polymer, where exonucleases can only degrade the ends. So an endonuclease cuts in the sequence. And at the site where it cuts, another protein then 
um, gets involved to um, bind to and to add the, 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 the poly A's. So, um, so, so once you've cleaved at this um, polyadenylation signal site, you then um, recruit these proteins to carry out the polyadenylation. So there's two proteins um, that are involved in carrying out this um, polyadenylation. So effectively, these proteins add a string of adenine residues in the absence of a template. And they just extend, um, and, and different messenger RNAs have different, different length poly A tails. It's not as if all messenger RNAs have a poly A tail of a certain length. Some have really long poly A tails and some have fairly short poly A tails. So people are still trying to understand the process of regulating the addition of, of these A residues. Because the length of the poly A tail is also thought to play an important role in the stability of the messenger RNA and therefore the amount of translation that will occur and therefore the amount of protein that will be present in the cell. So, um, so people, this is still an active area of research trying to understand what determines the length of the poly A tail and, um, and, and all of the functional consequences of that. But basically, for this lecture, there's, um, there's a sequence that's recognized and then at this um, adenylation sequence, we have an endonuclease that cleaves the transcript and then we have um, a couple of proteins that come in and add um, poly A residues at the three prime end. So the length of the um, ad adenylation, so this is just saying we've got an RNA and we add an ATP to it to give an RNA plus an, an, an extra A residue. And this can occur 80 to 250 times, if not more, to give these long um, uh, adenylated sequences at the end of the message. And um, and like I said, the polyadenylation enzyme does, does not require a template. So there is no DNA sequence that's got 250 T residues in it to code for the poly A tail. The poly A tail is added after the um, transcription has occurred, whilst the transcript is still associated with the polymerase. So I've got a diagram coming up that will show that. So we're about to look at this diagram here. So um, we've got messenger RNA capping polyadenylation and splicing, which are coordinately regulated during transcription. So the, um, I've already said to you that the, that the capping occurs during transcription, and we showed that happening at the carboxy terminal domain. Polyadenylation also happens during transcription, and also splicing can occur during transcription. So, um, so so effectively, um, RNA processing occurs as the messenger RNA emerges from the RNA polymerase II. So this is the little diagram that shows that. So how do we think about this diagram? I think I would start on the left side here. And we have initiation of transcription, and then we have um, elongation phase of transcription leading to the termination phase of transcription. Okay? So during transcription, the the messenger RNA is obviously growing in length during this elongation phase through to its full length at the before termination. And as the messenger RNA exits the exit channel, it comes into close proximity to the carboxy terminal domain where it comes across these capping enzymes to add that guanosine residue on the five prime cap through that unusual bond. Also, as, the, um, as elongation occurs, different proteins bind to the, the carboxy terminal domain and recognize in, intron and exon junctions. So as um, a, a, a little bit of sequence here is recognized, the, the um, splicing factors are able to cut out the intron and join together the two exons through um, a fairly complicated process. And this leads to a spliced intron exiting the um, complex. So the Introns are removed to join together the exons. And then as the three prime um, sequence, um, the three prime poly A sequence is, um, comes out, it's recognized by um, these polyadenylation factors which cleave the messenger RNA and then add the poly A tail away from the DNA 
um, template. So this is added um, after the fact, but it's, um, so all of this occurs during um, transcription. So you've got this coupling of capping, free prime, tailing, and splicing during transcription. So it's one of the more complex procedures that occur in cells. Okay. So um, now we'll just look at some of the, um, now we know where it happens and when it happens, we'll just have a look at the processes in, uh, of splicing in not a lot of detail, but just a, a bit of detail. So um, splicing, like I said before, is the processing of a pre-messenger RNA into what's referred to as a mature messenger RNA. Okay? And the complex of proteins that carry out splicing is a mixture of RNA molecules and protein molecules. Okay? And these RNA and protein molecules come together to form this bit of machinery that's referred to as a spliceosome. Okay? So, as I keep saying, molecular biologists love to add the word ohm onto the ends of words. So when we've got a lot of genes, we have a genome. When we have a lot of proteins, we have a proteome. When we have a lot of splicing factors, we have a spliceosome. And when we have a lot of things involved in, um, you know, the ribosome is also got the ohm thing because it's a big complex of many proteins and RNAs. So there's lots of ohms in molecular biology, and this is one of the first ohms. It's a spliceosome. And um, okay, so what I'm telling you here is that the spliceosome is made up of a whole bunch of RNA molecules and protein molecules. Um, the uh, the, the process of, a spl of splicing in, in terms of the chemistry of what happens and the process of what happens can actually has been um, observed at happening in some organisms in its auto self-splicing. So um, there's also um, in some organisms it's been noted that um, introns can be self-spliced out of the messenger RNA, which again gets back to this idea of um, an RNA world being where some of these rudimentary processes evolved and then proteins have got involved in making that process much more efficient because it's the RNA molecules that are involved in the catalytic cutting and joining of the uh, RNA, of the RNA molecules. So we've got um, a process of splicing. We have a spliceosome that carries out splicing um, in, in, in you know, uh, mammalians. And, and yeast and other organisms, but also some RNAs have been um, noted to carry out auto-splicing or self-splicing without um, these additional proteins. So when we're looking at messenger RNAs, um, it probably comes as a su surprise to you, it certainly comes as a surprise to me, that often the, um, the introns or the intervening sequences within genes, there's often more nucleotides in an intron than there are in the exons. So the introns can be bigger than the exons. So most of the um, gene sequence that is transcribed is removed before translation, which um, energetically is not a particularly good scheme. Um, there's a lot of people now studying introns and looking at the function of introns to see whether introns actually have function post-splicing because there's so many of them and there's, there's, they're in, in high amounts. So again, one of the hot areas of research right now is to study um, introns once they've been spliced out and to see what function they have in cells. So again, you don't need to know this for the lecture, but people are cloning introns and expressing them in cells to see what effect they have and doing lots of fun experiments to try and work out the role of introns or to establish do they have roles outside of just being cleaved away from a protein. Um, you don't need to know that for, the, for this subject, I just thought I, I, I'd, I'd mention that. Okay, um, so introns vary in size from you know, small intervening sequences of about 50 nucleotides up to sequences of up to 20,000 nucleotides, which makes our gene sequences very long, given that some genes might have 30 or 40 introns in their sequence. Um, exons, um, are typically less than a thousand nucleotides long and um, 
some exons can be fairly short, well, just a couple hundred nucleotides. So, again, I've shown this process before, this diagram before. This is just saying that these intervening sequences here are often much larger than the actual in exons that are going to be spliced together to give the messenger RNA. Um, another consequence of splicing is that you can actually, from one gene, you can actually code for multiple proteins because you can splice together a messenger RNA in different forms. You can take different bits of the messenger RNA and join them together so you can get different messenger RNAs made from one immature messenger RNA. And therefore, when they're translated, you're going to get different proteins with common domains but still different proteins being produced from one gene. And th th this kind of rationale or in observation has helped with um, trying to understand the, you know, cell biology because when be, you, you guys know the 35,000 genes say in, in the genome because the human genome has been sequenced but the g human genome, genome sequence was only sequenced what in 98 I think back then so in my undergraduate years and you know a lot of people who are doing science now they thought about genes long before the, the human genome was sequenced and people never would have guessed there's only 35,000 genes in the human genome. The, all the money was on, there's going to be double that at least. There's going to be, this, uh, you know. And then when suddenly it came out there's uh, only 35,000 genes, people were scratching their heads saying, well, there's many more proteins than there are genes. What's going on? How can, you know, a yeast have, a, which is a unicellular organism of one cell type, only have 6,000 genes, but yet were these, we've got multiple cell types with these huge organisms with billions and billions of cells, but we've only got five times as many genes as a yeast? How does that work? So a lot of our complexity comes from alternative splicing of genes into um, different proteins. So, um, yeah, so, so the number of proteins greatly exceeds the number of identified genes, and part of that conundrum that really confused us in the late 90s um, helps explain why, well, it doesn't help explain, but it gives us a bit of food for thought in trying to rationalize why that we only have, you know, um, a small number of genes compared to what we thought we'd have. Um, so this is just showing um, alternative splicing here. So here's a couple of exons in a simple model. And in one splicing regime, you're going to get all three of those exons joined together to give a mature message with the five prime cap and three prime tail and three exons. Whereas in an alternatively spliced version of that gene, you've only got two exons, okay? And you might, you know, wonder, well, they look pretty similar. Within these exons, you might have different protein domains. So you might have a transcription, you might have a DNA binding domain here, which make this thing a transcription factor. But in the absence of that domain, then it's not a transcription factor. Or you might have a a kinase activity in one of these domains. So you get versions of the protein that have different catalytic domains or, or, or parts to the protein through alternative splicing. So um, the mechanisms of alternative splicing are not well understood. Um, and I think you could rewrite that sentence to say, well, the mechanism of just normal splicing is still being researched and we're still learning more and more about splicing as we go on. So um, splicing is a very complex procedure. It's difficult to study. I, I spent five years in a, in a lab and a third of the lab were, were, were looking at splicing and these, the process and trying to study it. And there were each lab meeting, the little tidbits of information emerging from their research and you know, so people are, are trying to understand splicing. A lot is known about splicing, but it's um, still a lot more to be known about splicing, which is true for any area of, 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 of molecular biology. You know, you've got the textbook version of things which make it sound like it's really clear cut and well studied and no more questions to be asked. But when you get into the literature, you go, ooh, there's lots and lots of questions around all areas of, of biology. So, um, so nucleotide sequences at the borders between an intron and an exon play an important role in recognizing the fact that um, he's the end of an exon and he's the beginning of an intron. Okay? So that's important. Um, and 
some complex transcripts have um, alternative sites that can be um, cleaved for these polyadenylation sequences as well. So if you've got alternative splicing, you still need to cap your messenger RNA. So within the, the gene, there's alternative regions which will encode for um, these, these polyadenylation as well. And the, the textbook has um, a simple example of alternative splicing, and it's of a pro protein called um, calcitonin, which can also be um, alternatively spliced into another protein. And um, there's a diagram here to show that. So um, there was a gene which had been transcribed, and then there was a primary transcript made, and this primary transcript has a bunch of introns. It's got six, uh, sorry, a bunch of exons. So it shows six of those exons here. And um, one splicing pattern here joins together four of those introns, one, two, three, and four. Then this occurs in, say, the thyroid um, tissue. Whereas the same gene um, in a cell which is now part of the brain, which has the same gen genome as the, as the thyroid cell, but within the brain cell, it's cleaved differently because different proteins are expressed, different cleavage proteins are expressed, and therefore you get alternative splicing to produce a different um, um, messenger RNA which will code for a, a protein with a different activity, different regula regulatory mechanism, different, you know, different attributes. So alternative splicing and alternative polyadenylation um, um, can give rise to these two different um, transcripts giving two different hormones. And um, in the thyroid, we have a, a calcium regulating hormone, calcitonin, and in the brain, we get a calcitonin-related gene product inventively named. So we get two different um, proteins from one um, gene through alternative splicing. So again, in the different um, tissue, whether it be thyroid or brain, you get rise to these two distinct proteins which carry out different functions in the cell. So how does splicing occur? Um, I, I, I mentioned well, let me read the slide first before I talk. So, so splicing is catalyzed by this thing called a spliceosome. And part of the spliceosome, it's made up of individual proteins. There's a whole bunch of different proteins that come together to make this big spliceosome. So those things that come together to make the spliceosome are actually ribonuclear proteins, not just proteins. So again, a ribonuclear protein is just a complex of RNA and protein to make a functional enzyme. And in a riboprotein, ribonucleic protein, typically it's the ribosome component that carries out the catalytic activity. And that's true for um, splicing. The um, recognition of the um, messenger RNA sequence and the catalytic cutting of the messenger RNA sequence is carried out by the RNA sequence within these ribonuclear proteins. Um, so effectively, the RNA of these ribonuclear proteins um, base pairs with the messenger RNA, and it base pairs with the, the five prime splice site and the three prime splice site. So what that means is, if you look at this sequence at the top here, you've got the messenger RNA sequence here, you've got exon, intron, exon. So we read DNA from the five prime to the three prime direction, so within this intron here, you've got the five prime junction, and then you've got the three prime junction of this intron. So you've got the five prime splice site, which just means it's the five prime end of the intron, and the three prime splice site, which is the three prime end of the junction. So what it's saying is then you get um, that, that, the, um, that you get base pairing between the, pro the RNA of the ribonucleic proteins and the sequence at these junctions. But um, from a mechanistic point of view, if you think about it for more than a couple of nanoseconds, you'll realize, or if, if you know, the actual sequence that's recognized is only two base pairs. It's just an A and a G is enough to determine that. that, that that's the only thing that's conserved at the, um, 
the, the end of the exon. It's just an AG sequence, which is a very common sequence in any, pro, in any messenger RNA sequence. So it's not just the AG. There has to be other things involved in recognizing that part of the junction. So there's also some sequences here in the, um, at the 5 prime splice site. But again, it's not a, a particularly complicated sequence. So um, there's, there's probably some other things involved in, in recognizing these junctions as well. So, um, so what is this thing called the spliceosome that carries out splicing? It's a complex of five small nuclear ribonuclear proteins. And I've sort of staggered my pronunciation of that because the small nuclear, like S-N-R-N-P, that phrase it, it is used to, that, to make this acronym here. And we pronounce that as a SNRP, okay? Small nuclear ribonuclear protein. So that thing there, we, we just call them SNRPs. So SNRPs carry out splicing. And SNRPs come together to make the spliceosome. And SNRPs are just a complex of these small nuclear um, RNA molecules and some nuclear proteins. Okay? Um, there's also a whole bunch of other proteins involved in these, um, this, this complex. And they contain small nuclear RNAs. I'm not going to talk too much about those small nuclear RNAs, but I will just, for your background knowledge, show you one of these RNA molecules. And, and um, so you can have a bit of a think about them. So these RNAs are referred to as U1, U2, U4. You know, they've just got U something is the name of these um, small um, nuclear RNAs. So here's one shown here. And it's a single-stranded piece of um, RNA. And it folds up into a particular tertiary structure based on complementary base pairing within the single-stranded molecule. Okay? So um, it looks a little bit like a transfer RNA. I don't know if you're familiar with transfer RNAs. We'll look at transfer RNAs when we look at translation. But um, in the same way that we have complementary base pairing in double-stranded DNA, you can get complementary base pairing in a single-stranded nu nucleic acid as well, whether it be a sequence of DNA or a sequence of RNA. If it's single-stranded, then it can fold in on itself to form a structure. And this is showing how there's complementary conserved um, base pairing which control this RNA to fold up into a distinct structure. Okay? And then um, within this distinct um, folded RNA, proteins bind to it to form one of these SNRPs. This, um, okay? And then these SNRPs come together to form the spliceosome. And you can see here that there are sequences of the RNA which are conserved and that will bind to messenger RNA at those junctions between the introns and exons. So, um, I, and we're not going to talk too much about that, but you get complementary base pairing between regions of these SNRPs and the messenger RNAs, which will then cause breakage of the messenger RNA, removal of the intron, and then rejoining of the exons together. And that catalytic activity is normally carried out at these um, single-stranded regions that are complementary to the messenger RNA. So spliceosomes assemble from these SNRPs, these small nuclear ribonuclear proteins. And some other proteins get involved as well, which um, the textbook tells you they're rich in serine and arginine um, residues. Um, and these carry out splicing. Um, so the introns have a, a GU sequence shown here, which I talked about earlier, and the exons have an AG, which is shown here. So at the splice junction, there's a small region of, of conserved um, bases, and these are recognized by the SNRPs, but other details of how recognition occur have yet to be determined, because there has to be more to it than just those few nucleotides. Okay, and we're just to finish off, um, we're just going to quickly um, have a look at um, RNA transport. So, as I was mentioning to you, in eukaryotes, RNA synthesis occurs in the nucleus, but translation occurs in the cytosol. 
So the RNA has to get through the nuclear membrane. So um, they're made in the nucleus, they're processed in the cytoplasm, and therefore the messenger RNAs are, um, need, need to go into the cytosol. In the cytosol, they will be translated into a protein by a ribosome. And um, when we look at the ribosome in more detail, this ribosome here, um, we, we, we'll notice that the, um, the non-protein um, RNA molecules in the ribosome carry out various um, activities for, for that complex, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. So, um, so we know that different types of RNA are made. We've got messenger RNAs, we've got transfer RNAs, and a bunch of different sorts of RNAs. We're not going to go into detail, but there's different transport mechanisms for the different types of RNAs. Okay? Um, most of these um, RNAs um, are transported with proteins called exportins or importins, whether they're being moved um, in or out of the nucleus. These proteins have different names. Um, exportins bind to an RNA and help it move through these pores we have in the nuclear membrane, and then that, um, that then um, puts the, the RNA into the cytoplasm. Um, so we've got a diagram which shows that these transfer RNAs um, bind to, well, transfer RNAs bind to their own kinds of exportins. Our RNAs um, are exported in their um, pre-ribosomal um, exported with, with other proteins. So there's different systems for different RNAs without getting into too much of the detail. Um, here's one of those schemes shown here. And um, you've got in the nucleus at the top here, which confuses me because I always draw the nucleus at the bottom in my diagrams, but in the, you've got the nucleus at the top here labeled nucleus. So you've got the, the RNA molecule that's just been synthesized and it has to interact with one of these exporting proteins which will guide it through one of these pores in the nuclear membrane to get it into the cytosol. Okay? And then once it's in the cytosol, it dissociates to do whatever role it does in the cytosol. Some RNAs um, wants, you know, need, need to be taken into the nucleus, depending on the function of these things. So again, it's, it associates with these same kind of proteins which take it into the nucleus. So you've got like a, a, a cycle of protein movement in and out of the nucleus, and the proteins can carry around these, um, R, these, these RNA molecules with them. Again, it's too much detail to go into, but this transport protein is associated with a nucleotide. And whether it's associated with a GTP or a GDP molecule um, helps control the function of whether it's moving in or out of the nucleus. So you've got a protein that's binding to a nucleotide, and then it's, um, the, the nucleotide helps determine the structure of that protein so it can move in and out of the nucleus. Um, again, technically, you'd refer to these proteins as um, um, GTPases or GTP hydrolyzing proteins. So because they can hydrolyze GTP, they can modify that GTP into GDP. So um, the protein is able to hydrolyze that, that um, molecule, which helps control this circular process and movement of the messenger RNA. Um, all right. And just to finish off, um, two slides to say that um, we know that the messenger RNAs are going to be translated. We know that's a regulated process. Um, part of that regulation of translation revolves around the stability of the messenger RNA. So um, messenger RNAs are synthesized and degraded in a fairly brisk manner within the cell. So we have a balance between synthesis and degradation, which lead to the actual levels of these messenger RNAs in, in the cell. Um, degradation is catalyzed by um, nucleases, referred to as ribonucleases, because they're de degrading um, ribosomal you know, um, nucleic acids that contain ribonucleotides. Okay, so it's a ribonuclease. 
Um, and these degradation involves complete hydrolysis of the um, RNA into individual nucleotides, which can then be recycled into new messenger RNAs. So degradation rates vary greatly for different messenger RNAs. Um, in, in eukaryotes, there's a complex of these um, nucleases that come together to make a bigger machine that is involved in degradation, and that's called an exosome. So again, um, it's these exonucleases that come together, and when you join a lot of things together, we add the word ohm on the end, so we have these exonucleases, a whole bunch of them called an exosome. And they degrade um, messenger RNAs, and they degrade messenger RNAs from the three prime end. And don't forget, the three prime end has got the poly A tail, so the length of the poly A tail um, is involved in protecting the messenger RNA from degradation by these um, exosome. So this is just the last slide to, to show here's our messenger RNA, here's the five prime capped end, here's the three prime end that was polyadenylated, and this very large complex of these different exonucleases degrades the messenger RNA from the three prime end into it'll degrade the entire molecule and just leave behind the individual nucleotides, which can then be used to make another messenger RNA on demand. So it's... Um... All right, so um, thank you for your attention. Um, any questions, come have a chat, and I'll see you next week. Okay, thanks.